This program was made possible by the Florida Humanities Council. We come from all over and we become one state where we share in the history and become part of the culture that is Florida. The Florida Humanities Council, bringing Floridians together by sharing the stories of our state. are not simply words. For us, these are not simply words. You come and hear us manipulate the subtle sounds of the language in order to entertain you, and then you leave. You take with you the interesting bits of our souls that manage to break through to your psyche, and maybe approach us after the show and tell us how much you enjoyed it. But for you, that's all it is. A show. Something to liven up your evening and perhaps offer fodder for future conversations. But you know, the truth is, for me, these are not simply words. For us, these are blood red drops of our souls built upon this page after penetrating our hearts with this pen. These are dreams and nightmares ripped from our heads and laid bare before you to see and judge them. These, these are, are not our poems. These, these are our truths. We come out here, lay down our arms, lay open our hearts, and give to you a part of us that many don't get the opportunity to see. And yet, it's because we do that, that even those closest to us have been guilty of not realizing what we're truly saying. These, these are our words, but they are so much more than that. I grew up in Madras, Oregon. It's just a small little farming community. Both of my grandfathers served during World War II. And my grandfather on my mother's side, he actually fought in the Battle of the Bulge. And he was captured by the Germans and spent nine months in a German POW camp before he was able to escape. Now, it's 1986. I just graduated from high school <clears throat> and the movie Top Gun just came out. And I saw that and I wanted to be Maverick. So I walked over to the Navy recruiting station and I sat down in front of the recruiter. I was like, I want to fly jet, sign me up. But he took one look at my glasses and... No way! <sighs> okay, so I walked over to the Air Force recruiter, same thing, sit down, I want to fly jet, sign me up! But again, he takes one look at my glasses and... No way! <sighs> so I go and I talk to the Army recruiter, I talk to the Marine recruiter, and the Army. The Army just gave me a better deal. So I ended up signing up for the Army as a personnel mystery specialist. Michelle, come on out here. So I'm an Army brat, and my father is an Army intel officer. My mother is a Vietnam medic, enlisted. We follow the, them all over the world, from Miami to DC and back. I lived in Germany for five years. My parents retired so that I could have a stable home life and education, and we moved to Orlando. I went to Winter Park High School, and I graduated from UCF. And by the time it was all done, I was a local girl. But I missed the military lifestyle, and I liked traveling. I hit a wall somewhere after college. I knew I wasn't going to settle down in Orlando. I said. F it, I'm going in. And I went in the Air Force in 1996. Hold on. When I was very young, <clears throat> my father was a branch manager of a scientific equipment company. But he got laid off and he never found an equivalent paying job. But my mom wanted to keep the house. So we lived in an upper middle class neighborhood and went to middle class schools, but we didn't have money. I was the kid in Walmart clothes when everyone else was wearing name brands. 
I didn't fit in, <clears throat> so I got ridiculed and beat up a lot. I hated school. I had no interest in going to college, but I also didn't want the kinds of jobs you can get without a degree. I'd been in Boy Scouts. From there, I got drawn into junior ROTC. And I always wanted to fly. So when I found out you can fly helicopters in the Army without a college degree, I was like, sign me up. That was 1997. Um. I grew up in Utica, New York with my mom and sister. I had a bit of a tumultuous relationship with my mother growing up. She's, a re she's schizophrenic and a recovering drug and alcohol user. She'd disappear for weeks, even months at a time. While she was in and out of rehabs, we were in and out of the foster care system. When I was 15, I moved out of the house. I worked at Wendy's and I slept wherever I could. I went through a bit of a rough patch with drugs and alcohol, but somehow managed to finish high school. I'd been in ROTC and my cousin had just gotten out of the military, so I saw that as a viable way to gain the experience that I needed. So I'm walking home from school one day and a recruiter pulls up beside me. He rolls down his window, looks at me and says, can I give you a ride? <laughs> Next thing I know, I'm giving my mom the papers to sign me over to the military. I was only 17 at the time. At first, she refused, so I said, fine, don't sign. But when I turn 18, I'm going anyway, and you'll never see me again, period. Of course, she signed those papers, and I joined the Army in 2006. Antoine was born November 3rd, 1982. Only child but the father and myself. We was walking, his mom was being her kid. He go, Mommy, tell her mommy stop beating that baby. Anybody smaller than him, he was protective. He was in church at age two weeks old until he entered the military. Church home and school, shy student. Only to listen to contemporary music. He was a 3.8 GPA student. And from preschool until senior high. And when he did his homework, he would listen to the radio, he would watch TV at the same time. I was in um, Horace Mann Middle School, 1995-1996. I put him in the music department. I was the um, president for Horace Mann Music Department, uh, volunteer parent. So we were making our rounds around the school. We opened the orchestra door, we walked in. He go, that's what I want to play, David Yola. So at this point, we moved him to Orlando, 1999. He had to go through Orange County School Board administration to audition to get a Dr. Phillips Music Magnum number one top school even to the day. 1999 to 2001, he was second chair. I struggled to raise him. I couldn't give him everything he needed. That hurt me. So in 10th grade, he decided to go to work. I go, no, I'm responsible, not you. So he decided to go into the military to not have college debt, serve his country with all his um, other military people, and get a better neighborhood for us to live in. One day he said, Ma, I need you to be home. More than one time I go, why? He invited every military recruiter, Army, Navy, Air Force, to come certain time, certain day. And when Marine come, he opened the door, Marine come in, he go, Ma, it's Marine. And told him, I want to sit down, the Marine with the human go, we gonna give you hell, we don't give you no breaks, we gonna wear you out. He jumped up, that's what I want. I go, boy, are you crazy? Have you lost your mind? He looked at me with his eyes and I like, good hope. He's like, please, please, do please, beg, he beg me. I signed the papers. He signed up, he took the oath. I do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and that I will obey true faith and allegiance to the same, and that I will obey the orders of the United States of America and the orders of the officers appointed over me according to the regulations and the Uniform Code of Military Justice. So help me God. So help me God. So help me God. So help me God. I took pictures of him after he swore in. I had tears in my eyes. He looked at me so brave as to say, Mom, I'm okay. I said, baby, I know, but in my heart, in my mind, 
I was saying, I'm not. When I went into basic training, I had this plan, I wasn't prepared. I remember sitting on the back of the bus and looking at all these kids and thinking, what have I done? I remember getting off the bus in Oklahoma in September and dark out. The scent of sycamore trees hung heavy in the air, and now every time I smell them, I'm taken back to my first night of basic training. We hung around in a reservation area for a few days while they figured out where we were going. They were pretty kind to us there. They treated us like humans. But then they put us on different buses and shipped us out to our basic training platoons. And then, then they were not kind. Get off my bus! Get the hell off my bus! Alaya, move, move, move! What? That you don't know your left from your right, Private? Yes, no. Shut up! I'm doing the talking here! And you, maggot! You better wipe that smile off your face. I'm here to tell you all that if one of you messes up, all of you just messed up. Get out of these faces! <coughs> what? Donkey kicks! That's your heart! I'm not gonna lie, I cried for the first three nights. All I wanted was to go home. Well, maybe not home, but I wanted to be able to wake up and say, I don't wanna do this today. March time, march! Left, 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 right, left. Make a hole! Now I was an Eagle Scout and I had my shit together, but they stuck me with this battle buddy. I don't know why marching is hard for some people. He just couldn't get his feet right. Recruit, what's wrong with you? Don't you know your left from your right? And you, you're his battle buddy? Why aren't you putting him straight on this? Get down, beat your faces. And we'd both get smoked for that. One, two, three. One. One, two, three. Two. One, two, three. 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 Recover. <sighs> Change hut. Me and my basic training battle buddy, it was not an enduring bond. <laughs> the best way I can describe basic training was it was time when they took away all our freedom so we truly knew what it would meant to not be free. It was a time of getting into shape and learning that when you think you've absolutely done that last push that you could possibly do, you can really do five more. It was a time when they broke us down and pulled the civilian out of us, but then built us back up into soldiers. It bonded us. We wouldn't let each other fail. to me. They say, you are now a Marine. He was so proud. We was happy our son dream come true. But we got to keep moving forward to live with the internet's feeling, not have an Antoine around anymore. Forward, march, left, 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 right, left. scores on the ASVAB to do my MOS, the military occupational specialty. I was mortuary affairs, and it was a very mentally taxing job. We assisted with the autopsies of soldiers who died overseas, as well as processed their personal effects, all the things they didn't have on them when they died, such as journals, letters, computers. You had to get a security clearance to do this job because one of our duties was to go through those journals, make sure that there was no sensitive information contained in those letters or on those hard drives before we sent them back home. We were also trained in how to be sensitive to the religions of the deceased service members because we were the ones performing the funeral ceremonies. We were the ones carrying the caskets. I was trained in Fort Lee, Virginia. I remember within a day or two of arriving there, they had us in civilian morgues assisting with the autopsies there. The weird thing is, within a week or two, the bodies, and this may sound terrible, but the bodies, they were no longer people. 
They were now objects that we had to work on. In fact, it helped to be a little lighthearted and to have a sense of humor. It helped that we, we joked and we laughed and we act like there's not 10 plus bodies lying in neat rows in front of us because we have to, because our sanity depends on it, because we represent the second oldest job, the United States military, mortuary affairs, and our creed is to treat all the remains that come across our tables, be they bodies or parts, with dignity, honor, and respect, and we're damn good at our jobs. But that takes its toll on us. So about everything else, we joke. We joked because we didn't have any seriousness left. But it was different working on someone's personal effect. I have no connection to this body, but when I'm reading their letters and looking through their photo albums, it puts a whole new life to us. They, they sit us in front of piles of junk, but this isn't junk. These are piles of life, stereos and CDs, books and computers, letters to loved ones, journals. Those, those are the hardest. Pages imbued with the final moments of those men and women whose bodies we just worked on. I remember one of the final cases that I worked on when I was in AIT. I was reading and redacting the journal of this kid, maybe 17, 18 years old. He had parents, he had a little sister, he even had a girlfriend back home. I remember reading that he felt unsafe in his current location, so we put in a transfer request. But days before he was supposed to ship out, they got overrun and he was killed. I spent maybe a week working on this kid's case. And then I was shipped off to Dover, Delaware, the port of entry for all US military killed overseas. And who's the first body that I work on? It was him. But he wasn't just a body anymore. I knew him, I knew his story, and it brought a whole new level of intimacy to it. <coughs> After I left basic training, <clears throat> they shipped me off to Fort Benjamin Harrison, Indiana. There I learned how to become a personnel administrative specialist. They taught me how to process awards, promotions, evaluation reports, and how to help people fix their pay. After I graduated from there, I got shipped off to Fort Knox, Kentucky, where I was assigned to a field artillery unit. And then after that, I got sent over to Germany, Stuttgart, Germany, where I became a member of the 7th Corps headquarters. And in 1989, we deployed for Operation Desert Storm. Now, I wasn't on the front lines, but I was back in the area where we were under constant threat of scud attack. And my job was the mail. Well, after the war, we, we returned back to Germany. And I remember on our concern, they were digging a utility ditch between two of the buildings. And the contractors, they, they struck something with a backhoe and it started smoking. And it turned out that it was an Allied bomb that had been dropped there in World War II. Well, they pulled us out of all the buildings and they sent us out to the dining facility parking lot. We stood out there for what seemed like forever. And this army truck comes pulling up and the staff sergeant and the specialist get out of it. And the staff sergeant walks up to the general and he starts ge telling the general what needs to happen. And the general starts doing it. And I was like, I want to be that guy. <laughs> well, it ended up that they were EOD techs. Explosive Ordnance Disposal. So long story short, I put in to reclassify and I was approved and I went off to EOD school. They shipped me to Eglin Air Force Base where I had to learn <clears throat> how to disarm bombs, both foreign and domestic, how to disarm IEDs, anything chemical, biological. We even had to learn how to disarm nuclear weapons. See, in EOD, you have to know it all. The EOD motto is initial success or total failure. You've got one shot at it. So after EOD school, I spent some time in Panama, and we were cleaning up the ranges and getting everything ready to turn back over to the Panamanians. And then after Panama, they sent me back over to Germany, this time to Mannheim, Germany. And I've been promoted to Staff Sergeant at this point. 
And I remember I came walking in the shop one day, and everybody was gathered around the television. So I walked over to see what was going on, just in time to see the planes flying into the Twin Towers. And I remember I looked over at my guys. I said, we better get ready to go. I signed up to be a forward observer, the guy on the front lines who calls for artillery fire and gives them the coordinates to shoot at. I wasn't picky about my job since I planned to apply for flight school as soon as I finished training. My first duty station was Baumholder, Germany. It's about two hours southwest of Frankfurt. I arrived in January. It was 10 degrees below zero. I had sergeants yelling at me to do push-ups and sit-ups in the snow, shoveling sidewalks in the motor pool in a snowstorm. And it wasn't long before I went from, I'm going to fly helicopters and retire after 20, to thinking, the military is not for me. <laughs> But I still did my best, and I was a pretty good soldier. And after a few years, I got promoted to sergeant <clears throat> and moved to Fort Stewart, Georgia. Being a sergeant was a different enough experience that I began thinking, you know, this isn't so bad. Maybe I'll apply for flight school after all. By this point, I had six months left in the Army, and my unit was deployed to Kosovo. So I re-enlisted so I could apply for flight training. That was May of 2001. Kosovo was fun. It wasn't wartime, there was no one shooting at us, but it was still real. I was with the Brigade Reconnaissance Troop, and we were setting up observation posts, sitting in a bush totally camouflaged from head to toe, overwatching old world peasant villages looking for weapon smugglers for days on end. I got really gung-ho in Kosovo. I wanted to fight, I wanted to go to war. When 9-11 happened, I was like, send us. They didn't. After we got home from Kosovo, I rode my motorcycle too fast around a corner and into a guardrail. I was laid up for over a month with a broken arm, a fractured pelvis, and three torn ligaments in my knee. While convalescing, I bought a house, and I got a dog. I read a Tom Clancy novel about a fictional war between Israel and Egypt, and there was this scene where the Israeli tanks were just picking off the Egyptian tanks, and an Israeli soldier said, you know, this isn't as much fun as I thought it was gonna be. And something about that line, that scene, opened my eyes to a reality of war that I hadn't seen before. And my dog and I bonded, and as I healed from the accident, I changed into a person much less sure I wanted to go to war and kill people. I went to basic training, it was no big deal. I was older. I hopped a bus and I went from basic to tech school. I'd chosen to be a loadmaster, which means that they check on the supplies onto aircrafts and balance them. It wasn't very long I realized I don't want to do this. Everybody in the Air Force wants to fly a plane. I just want to fly a desk. And I became a personnel specialist. Human resources, cradle to grave administration, kind of like radar for MASH with his teddy bear and his clipboard. It's a flexible job. You can work in an office or you can be deployed downrange. <clears throat> My first duty station was England. I was there for five years from 1996 to 2001. I loved England. More importantly, I fell in love in England. A friend of mine took me to a barbecue and there was this his roommate was sitting there, surrounded by women. It was a long-legged cutie, Latino, looked like Ricky Martin. And I said to the girls, you really should let him breathe. And he said, ja, room to breathe. <laughs> he had swag. And seven weeks later, we were married. He was a ground radio engineer, which means that on a good day, he would follow big cheeses around, giving them a microphone, making them sound good. But the other half of his job was that he encrypted the transmissions of radios from the aircraft to the towers. He would go all over the world um, to all kinds of really cool deployments. Now, Gabriel, my first son, was born but he was born after we went on a romantic weekend when Lou had deployed to Ramstein, Germany. And he had flown me over, and we were in this cafe. And he ordered me a sandwich, and a bumblebee thought this was the best sandwich in the world because he flew into it, and I bit into him. And I ended up with this great big fat lip for my whole romantic weekend. <laughs> Baby, please, don't you want to kiss me? But Gabriel came anyway. He's got dual citizenship. Now, 9-11 happened and we were being sent back to the States. 
for our next duty station to Columbus, Mississippi, where my second son was born, Adrian. And from there, we were sent to Langley, Langley, Virginia. We bought a home there. And this was the place where I got my very first really cool deployment. Because all the while that Luke had been traveling all over the world, trans transmitting messages from Navy helicopters to Marine bases, I had been shoveling paperwork. But I got to go to Panama with six jet fighter pilots to protect President Bush while he was in Panama for the Conferences of America on Poverty. It was an intense deployment. I completely forgot Lou's birthday. I missed Halloween and the kids' costumes. When I came back, we did this post-deployment staycation. We went to Bush Gardens, and I remember seeing the boys sitting on Lou's knee, and they were all three singing The Last Unicorn. And I thought, life just doesn't get any better than this. I didn't see Antoine for a year. He was an Iceman training for mounting for Ben Laden. When he returned home, back to Virginia, I spent two days with him on a base. While he was home, he would go and work in the recruiting office. He said to me, Mom, I came here to go fight. We trained for combat fighting, but we just sitting around doing nothing, play fighting with each other. He said, I'm ready for the real action. While I was in the library, walking down the steps, coming home, I got this phone call from Antoine. He said, Mom, I just called to let you know I'm putting in for Iraq. I said, please don't go, because I knew three and a half years before he mentioned military, I was going to lose him in the military. So he said, this is what I want to do. I said, please don't go. He said, my friend Marine, his wife also Marine, he was all to Iraq, and she divorced him if he go to Iraq, so I'm going to save his marriage. All my other buddies, each and every one is going to Iraq. Why not me? If I live and live, I die, I die. At this point, I'm crying. People coming to me, you're hollering me. I say, please don't go, Antoine. I don't want to get you back in a casket and body parts. And I, I, you know, I just miss my baby. You know, he went on his own because it's something he wanted to do. In Kuwait, just before the initial invasion into Iraq, I bunked next to my commander, Captain Tristan Aitken. <clears throat> he was reading a book by a military colonel about the effects on soldiers of killing the enemy. I read it. Killing people haunts soldiers. It haunts them. I read this just before we crossed the border into Iraq on March 20th, 2003. I was attached to an infantry battalion headquarters, so I wasn't on the front lines and didn't see much action. We began our final push into Baghdad on April 2nd. We kicked off at 10 o'clock at night and drove all through the night in pitch black with no headlights. <clears throat> as the sun was coming up, we were driving down this highway that struck me as beautiful. There were palm trees lining it. But there are also foxholes. Every 50 meters, there is a foxhole on the side of the road. And every foxhole I looked into, there were two human-shaped piles of sand at the bottom, bodies of Iraqi soldiers killed and covered by the dust kicked up from our vehicles. We stopped and set up our positions near the Baghdad airport. The Iraqi army was still asleep. It was still early. They didn't know we were there. So it was all quiet. <clears throat> I'd been awake for over 24 hours. So I crawled under a Humvee and told my guys, hey, wake me up if anything happens. I'm going to take a nap. Gosh, sorry. And I went to sleep. Sorry, 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 sorry. You missed it. We got mortar. And there was a firefight. And there was a Bradley that got hit by the Rocky tank. And I slept through that? That's embarrassing. When I got up, <clears throat> there were still firefights going on in the distance, but we weren't being actively engaged. I remember looking down the road and seeing a firefight going on. There was a palm tree that had muzzle flashes at the end of it, like an Iraqi soldier was up there with his rifle shooting at Americans. It was about 400 meters away, and I didn't return fire. And it's still nagging me to this day, questioning that decision. 
The next evening, we got word that my commander, Captain Aiken, had been killed in another part of the city. Detail! Attend! Boom! Present! Arms! Captain Tristan Aiken of the 41st Field Artillery Battalion, 3rd Infantry Division at Fort Stewart, Georgia, of State College, Pennsylvania, died of injuries sustained from hostile gunfire in Baghdad, Iraq, on April 4th, 2003. Order! Halt! After he was killed, I was so angry. For the first time, I saw the Iraqi people as my enemy, and I kept thinking about this guy that I had seen as we drove in, who looked at me like he wanted to kill us. And I thought, what if he was the one that killed Captain Aitken? And in that moment, I decided that the next person I see that even looks at me wrong, I'm going to shoot. Everything in me wanted to kill in that moment. But then my unit rested for a few days. And in the downtime, my anger shifted from the Iraqi people to the US civilian leadership. If we hadn't been in that war, my friend wouldn't have been killed. In 2000, my next duty station was here at Cape Canaveral. And in 2003, my unit got deployed to Iraq. My team got fragged out to the shitty little camp called Camp Solidarity. It was right outside of Sadr City, which was one of the worst places to be in Iraq at the time. I remember this one morning, we got a call. They wanted us to go out and do a post-blast analysis on a suicide bomber who had detonated himself. See, there was this square. It had three mosques around it. And the square had been full of people. <clears throat> And a suicide bomber had walked into the middle of this crowd and detonated himself. So we head out, we're heading that way, and just as we pulled into the square, another suicide bomber walked up next to an Iraqi police car, detonated himself, and killed the two police officers inside. Immediately I got on the radio and I called my security element and I told him, the risk is too high here to just do a post-blast analysis. We're out of here, we're leaving now. As we were trying to turn the vehicles around, a third suicide bomber came out of the woodwork and he started heading towards us. Somehow the Iraqi police spotted him and they shot him and killed him. Fuck, now I got a dead guy with a suicide vest on. Now we gotta stay. So we set up the best we can, and I decide that the best course of action is to put an explosive charge on my robot. I'm gonna run my robot down, put this charge on this guy's chest and make him go away. Well, my robot clears my truck, <clears throat> and just then, every communication device I have starts going off. Stop what you're doing. You're on CNN. They don't want us to blow up a body on the news. So now, now instead, I have to do one of the most dangerous things that there is to do. I have to put on this 85 pound bomb suit and I have to walk out there myself. And the thing that makes it so dangerous is most suicide vests, have two triggers in them. The first trigger is a trigger that the suicide bomber himself can push to blow himself up. The second trigger is usually a remote control device placed somewhere in the vest that a handler who is watching from afar can detonate in case the suicide bomber chickens out. I'm mad as hell. So I put on this, this 85 pound bomb suit and I start walking down there and all I can think about is that remote control device. You know, I have no idea where this handler is. I have no perimeter at all. I don't even know where the fucking CNN guys are. And I get about halfway down to the suicide bomber and somebody starts shooting at me. 
I got bullets ricocheting all around me. And I'm trying to move as fast as I can at 85 pounds of suit. But I'm here to tell you, you don't move very fast. I hear a bunch of shooting off in the distance. And the Iraqi police come back out and they give me the thumbs up. They've shot and killed the shooter. So I make the rest of the way down to the suicide bomber. And I take a piece of deck cord and I rig it along his side. But my deck cord has a plastic cap on the end of it. I really don't know how that got there. Because see, at this point, I really don't give a shit anymore. So I set it up, I walk back to my truck, and the suicide bomber blows up. That incident really, really, really affected me. I am just pissed off at the world. I, I have this attitude like, you know what? I say we just shoot them all and God sort them out. Because you know what? I am sick and tired of taking so many risks. I'm sick and tired of a command who sits back in an office and tries to armchair quarterback what I'm doing. I'm just mad at the world. And the next morning I wake up and I'm still just in the same attitude, just pissed off at everybody. And we get this call. Rocky Police Station, they collected some explosives and they want us to come and take care of them. So we go out there and the, the explosives are in pretty bad condition. And I want to put them in the back of my truck and transport them. But there's an open field back behind the police station. But, and so we're going to go out there and we're going to blow them up out in this field. But to get to this field, we have to cut through the neighbor's yard. So as we're going through and we get into the backyard, there's a bunch of kids playing back there. And this one little girl, maybe seven, eight years old, she comes up to me and she grabs my hand. And she just looks up at me with this great big huge smile. And she's just so proud to be with a soldier. And she walks me back to the back fence. We jump over the fence, we go out into the field, we set up our shot. We come back, we jump back over the fence, and these kids, they're sitting there waiting for us again, and this same little girl comes up and grabs my hand again. And this time she says something to me in English. <coughs> so we decide we can use her kind of as a translator, because see, by now, her parents have come out back, and they want to know what's going on. And we want to get everybody to the front side of the house, because we don't want anybody to get hurt when we blow up the explosives. So we get everybody around to the front, we pop our shot, it blows up, everything's good. And this little girl, I notice that she's eyeing this really colorful pin that I have stuck in my vest that I've been using to write my reports. So I pull out the pin and I give it to this little girl. And she got so excited. You would have thought I just gave this girl a brand new BMW. <laughs> and then her dad, her dad comes up to me and he smiles, and he reaches out and he shakes my hand. He can't speak a lick of English, but I'm here to tell you that was one of the best thank yous I've ever had in my life. And I decided right then and there, from that day forward, the reason that I was over there was for that little girl and what she represented. See, I wanted that little girl to be able to grow up someplace safe. Unfortunately, they pulled all of us out of Iraq before we could get that job done. Antoine and I had a special connection. While he was in Iraq, wherever he was, he, I knew something was wrong. He was upset. While he was there, nine weeks in Iraq, all of a sudden, my spirit, my soul become restless. I was just irritable, nervous. I need to talk to somebody. I don't know what to say. I don't know how to get started, but nobody will understand. They will think I'm crazy because they don't understand what I feel. So I walked to a plaza, eight blocks, one o'clock in the morning. I got to call Kelp Pennington. I got to know what's wrong with my baby. Something is wrong. He's upset. Nobody answer. Now I'm walking and I'm like irritated. I'm crying. I'm trying to hold back tears, my body making me cry. I'm saying, Lord, don't take Antoine from me. I'm not ready. 
I can't stand him not being in my life. I felt guilty for the others. Some, some parents gonna be grieving, so I pray for all of them. Brought up each and every one of them come back home to their loved ones, not just Antoine. After an hour, my body relaxed. I said, thank you, Lord, for giving Antoine another day of life with me. I still have it, and all the other families. Two days later, I'm in a deep sleep. All of the time, Eastern Standard, 8, 16 a.m. Sunday morning, before we went to church. Right now, and I'm in deep, deep sleep. Somebody had a hammer, hit me right here. I said, straight up, the pain so bad. I just, oh, it's worse, worse than a labor pain. My chest, my heart, my legs, everything, so bad. I never felt before. I just slept in the bed, I'm falling in a knot. The whole bed shaking, the whole bed shaking. I would think, I gotta get to the hospital, I gotta get to the hospital. I'm trying to uncurl my body to reach my phone, I can't. The pain's so bad. It wasn't me, but I heard this like inner voice saying to me, I wanna die, I wanna die, let me die, let me die. And all of a sudden, my body just stretched out in the bed. I stood up. I said, my baby dead. I go, no, 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 no. I, I still have him. I dismissed it. I went on to church. This is word. This is November 15th. November 16th, midnight. I lean on my big door, screen door locked, lit up bright like this. Watch every car that passed. Finally, 4.42 a.m., this van, Put in front of my door, slow down and stop. Turn to my yard. I'm still leaning. And I was thinking, if it's two Marines, my baby's surely dead. I saw that first Marine and passenger. I said, well, Antoine is injured. I saw that second Marine. I stood straight up. <clears throat> now I'm pissed, I'm mad. I don't want them there. You shouldn't be here. Why are you? I'm thinking, why are you here? You shouldn't be here. I'm not ready for this. They got right along here where his shoes at. I said, I already know. He was shot in the head. He went unconscious and lived four minutes. And they go, this dumb look like each other like. They go, they asked me, who came to talk to you? I said, my baby let me know we got a special connection. He called you on the phone. At this point, I'm so pissed they there. I say, I didn't answer. I said, come on in. I sit down, I turn my back to them on the sofa. They standing here by the front door. I turn my back to them. I say, now, tell me your story. Was he wounded? They say, yes. I say, where is he? I was hoping they could say, I can go and touch him. He was still alive, wounded. They say, mama, he was shot in the head. He did not make it. Detail, a dead home. Free dead home. Lance Corporal Antoine D. Smith of Orlando, Florida, and of the 3rd Battalion, 5th Marine Regiment, 1st Marine Division, 1st Marine Expeditionary Unit, died of injuries sustained from hostile gunfire during combat operations in Fallujah, Anbar Province, Iraq, on November 15, 2004. He received the Navy Marine Achievement Medal posthumously. Order home! I began throwing things off the coffee table, just slamming against the wall. And I walked into his room, opened his door, and I laid in his bed. Well, he once laid. They said I passed out while I'm viewing his body, and I, I was heavily sedated. They called 911, hospitalized me overnight. I was heavily sedated at his funeral service.
Coming home from Iraq was a trauma, too. I'd spent six months in a tightly bonded brotherhood, and then I was in my house, alone. Captain Aitken was dead, and what was this war about? Why? I wanted out of the army, but I had two years left on my reenlistment. I fell into a deep depression. I started drinking a lot, and then I got a DUI. And then I started thinking about killing myself, but I got myself together eventually, and then we got orders to go to Iraq again. I thought so seriously about refusing. It wasn't my war. I didn't want to go. But in the end, I was more afraid of the dishonorable discharge than I was of going to Iraq. And two, there was Kyle, this 19-year-old kid. He was fresh out of training and brand new to our unit, put on my team. He was 19 years old, he had a 17-year-old wife, they had a two-month-old baby. If I refused, he would get stuck with another chief, someone who was maybe a hard charger and might get him killed. So I went. Our second deployment was the entire year of 2005. My company was tasked with highway patrol. We were stationed just outside of Samara, Iraq. In November, we were on patrol, and we saw a tire in the road, and it looked like it had been placed there and might be hiding a bomb, so we called EOD, and we set up overwatch, and we waited. While we were waiting, I heard a shot. In my mind, it sounded like Kyle shooting his 9mm handgun as a warning shot, so I asked him, what are you shooting at? And he says, I, I, I'm shot, I'm shot. Uh, in my mind, it's still his 9 mil, so I'm thinking, fuck, this kid just shot himself. And I look, and he's standing beside me in the turret of our truck, and his gun's still in the holster, and his leg's fine, so I'm like, hmm. And then he sits and turns towards me, and there's this gaping hole in his shoulder, and I realize this kid didn't shoot himself, and now I have to figure out what to do with this wound. The bone was broken and leaning forward through the hole. Blood was spurting out everywhere. Smoke was wafting up out of the hole. And they had issued us these new bandages. They called them Israeli bandages. <clears throat> We'd only trained with them once, and it was 11 months prior. It came in a vacuum-packed tube. When I opened it, the cloth stayed compressed and hard. And I didn't know how to use it. And I'm looking back and forth between the bandage and the wound. Like, what, how the, do, do I just stick the tube in the hole? I didn't. And fortunately, just then, the EOD team showed up, and they had a medic with them. Long story short, we put him on a helicopter and watched him fly away. And it was surreal. This kid that I'd been responsible for for the last year is now gone. And he's alive, but gone. And tomorrow I have to go back out on patrol and there will be someone new in his seat. And tonight I have to clean his blood and chunks of flesh and bone from my truck. Christmas of 2005. We're together and Lou got a phone call. He's got another deployment. He's got a choice. He can go to Afghanistan or Djibouti. Uh, and the kids are dancing around the house. Chupuri. I was personnel. I could have intervened. But I let him choose, and he chose Djibouti. So on February 5th, I put him on a plane, and off he went. I remember packing his Valentine's Day gift. He called me, he said, I forgot my passport. Could you send it to me? And I stuffed it into the Valentine's Day gift and sent it off. February 16th, he calls to tell me I love you. I said, that's nice. I'm not working tomorrow. Tomorrow's President's Day and I'm off. Call me at home. Love you. On President's Day, the kids and I went up, cleaned the house, had a great time. Ended off the day at Sonic. And as we're pulling away from the restaurant, we're at the red light, and I get this really eerie thought or feeling or voice. And it says, I can't stay, I have to go, I'm no longer needed. I look up, light turned green, and off we went. Popped the kids into the bubble bath, pajamas. 11 o'clock that night, I got a, no a knock on my door. It was a young medic, the chaplain, Lou's commanding officer, and my commanding officer. 
They said that Lou had gone missing in a helicopter collision over the Gulf of Aden. They didn't know where he was. I turned to my commander and I said, you don't walk away from a helicopter crash. <coughs> I said, you don't know that. And the medic came forward and said, do you want us to stay with you? I said, no, please, you're no good to me here. Go home to your family. And the minute the door closed, I got on the phone to every intel officer I'd ever met or worked with, every medic downrange that I could find. And about 10 o'clock the next morning, I finally got a hold of someone that he and I, that Lou and I knew in England. Only now he's the supervisor casually at headquarters. This is Michelle. I'm so glad you called me. Lou didn't make it. We've notified the next of kin. It's your responsibility to tell his family in Puerto Rico. And that phone call, you could hear them throwing furniture and screaming. They were angry. At that, I asked the casualty team to tell my children. But the boys were too young. They just didn't understand. Two or three days after that initial news, I started planning funeral ceremonies. The Langley Chapel filled up with over a thousand people. They issued me this lieutenant in a service dress blue suit to walk me down the aisle. I looked at him and I thought, I didn't get to walk down the aisle with my husband when I married him. I'll be damned if I'm gonna walk down the aisle with this yuck in a blue suit. And I scooped up both boys in my arms and we went down the aisle double time with this lieutenant chasing after us with all his decorum. And the days after that were very dark. I can remember seeing shadows and hearing voices. I was two months pregnant. I lost 19 pounds in three weeks time and I miscarried. Four months later when my, my commander said he was retiring, I slipped my separation paperwork underneath his. I said, sign me out too. And I left the Air Force in 2006. Detail, attend home. Present homes. Staff Sergeant Luis M. Melendez Sanchez of Bayamon, Puerto Rico and of the 1st Communication Squadron, Langley Air Force Base, Virginia, died as a result of the collision of two CH-53E Marine helicopters over the Gulf of Aden on February 17, 2006. Order Homes! You are relieved from the Air Force. In 2006, they deployed my unit to Afghanistan. Now, compared to my last deployment to Iraq, this deployment was a, a walk in the park. I mean, we had incidents and we had problems, but there really wasn't anything really life-threatening. And then when I returned home after that deployment, I started having a lot of personal problems. I couldn't sleep. I was losing control of my emotions. I was getting angry all the time. And I was starting to drink. And up to the point to where my wife started complaining about it. So when I went to my post deployment physical, I reported it to the doctor. And the doctor sent me over to the uh, mental health folks right away. And they diagnosed me with PTSD. But I, I was confused because, like I said, you know, th this deployment had been a cakewalk compared to Iraq. And the way they described it to me is, it's like you, you have a pot up in your head. And every time you go through a traumatic event, they pour a little bit of water in that pot. Well, when I had left Iraq, my pot was full. And with the few little things that did happen in Afghanistan, it was enough to make my pot bubble over. Well, my PTSD, it kept me out of the fight for a while. I ended up going to Fort Stewart, Georgia, and I was training EOD techs coming right out of school. But then in 2009, I got deployed back to Iraq. They needed platoon sergeants over there. 
By now, it had calmed down quite a bit. And then, after we returned from Iraq, I spent my last three years of service up in Fort Drum, New York. And then in 2012, after 26 years of active duty, I retired. As a mortuary affairs specialist, I spent time in Aberdeen, Maryland, Dover, Delaware, and Fort Lee, Virginia. But over time, this buildup started happening within me. If I had to affix blame to anything in particular, it wasn't the bodies. I'd learned to deal with them no problem. I'd perfected my defenses early on. But as time passed, those defenses began to crumble. We were working on kids who were the same age as us. I'd learn these personal details about them and begin to assign them to myself. This guy likes chocolate ice cream? I like chocolate ice cream. He likes pizza? I like pizza. He likes this type of girl? And so on and so forth. It was all becoming difficult to process. I started having difficulties. I started having difficulty sleeping. I couldn't focus. I was seeing a therapist numerous times a week. My struggles were not unknown to my superiors, but there was only so much that they could do. They put me on Depakote and Trazodone, but I always felt like the medication was more for those around me than it was for myself because the medication, it would stop me from reacting negatively, stop me from breaking down in tears, but inside of my mind, it was all still there. I still wanted to cry, but now, without any way to release that, I felt like I was suffocating. And to make matters worse, my personal life was getting piled on top of it. My grandmother had just died. I got into a really fight, ugly fight with my girlfriend, so bad that I went into the bathroom, punched the mirror, and almost cut off my thumb. It was all just becoming too much to handle. And that night, it sort of clicked in my mind. I texted a friend of mine. I timed it very specifically so that no matter what she did, it would be too late. And then I, I attempted to end my own life. They, they say, they say that they can't understand how anyone could be so selfish as to take their own life. Well, I say, I say that I can't understand how anyone could be so blind as to see someone set on fire every single day and not understand why they might want to put out the flames. They, they put me in a psych unit. This was not the last time that I'd attempt to take my life. And it was not the last time that I'd end up in a unit like that. Long story short, I was no longer fit for duty. They wouldn't let me change my MOS, so they discharged me. I was damaged goods. <clears throat> I had six months left in the Army when I got home from my second deployment. I'd been sober for a year before that deployment. When I got back, I was like, fuck that. I remember sitting on my front porch with my buddies, drinking, lining the railing with our beer bottles, talking about what the fuck do we do with our lives now, and how the American dream just felt like so much bullshit after what we'd been through, and how the only thing that really matters in this world are the people we love. And then I got out of the army and studied philosophy and psychology at the University of Central Florida. A few drunken years into the degree, I took a class on Native American philosophy. And what they said about the interconnectedness of everything, of us with the land and with each other, it really spoke to me. But I didn't know how to integrate it, so it stayed very academic. I thought maybe my life path would be to go into the ivory tower and teach. But then a friend of mine from serving in Iraq, Dylan Hartsfeld, was killed by police in his dad's front yard in a stupid, drunken tragedy. And again, I fell into despair and rage. In my grief, I made a vow that I would devote my life 
to tearing down the system that would rather kill my friend than help it. I signed out of the Army on a Friday, and I started a civilian job the very next Monday, working for a company that built industrial boilers. One of the worst things I could have ever done. Because see, this, this comp or the Army, the Army had been super structured. There was a regulation that covered everything. And this company had no structure to it at all. And I just didn't fit in. And I lasted there about six months before I got fired. It was a huge, huge blow to me. Because see, I was Sergeant England. I was the guy that everybody came to for answers. I was the guy that everybody looked up to. I wasn't the guy who gets fired. By the time I got out, I was still trying to process the fact that I was still alive, let alone the fact that I was no longer a teenager. My entire adult life had been spent in the military. So I was dealing with some unforeseen obstacles, such as getting the levels of my medication right, and to put it bluntly, the fact that I wasn't a combat vet meant that I had to work that much harder to have my trauma my post-traumatic stress recognized, be it amongst other veterans or even in the VA. I noticed that combat vets get out of the military and they say I deployed and everyone says let's start talking. But non-combat vets, they're forced to internalize more. I go to see a new doctor and the first thing he asks me if, is if I deployed. When I tell him no, he says, how do you have PTSD then? And I have to explain my story again and again and again. At this point, when I'm talking to other people, especially combat vets, I don't even mention my service because to many, my experiences are lesser because they didn't happen downrange. Marginalized. When you lose a spouse, you're placed in a box. You have to do certain things. Not this. Don't do that. You certainly don't date. There's so many different kinds of Gold Star families. Mothers, children, siblings. It doesn't matter. It's a jolt to the system. There's an amputation and there's isolation. You become a part of a club nobody wants to belong to. They know it's coming, but some of us don't know. I have PTSD 10 years on now. There's grief. You may not see it. I hide it really well. Remind us of Antoine. Places, colors, words, and food. I gave him the final wish for me. He won a T-bone steak. Even have the picture, the food he left on his plate. Our last, first and last words to each other, morning, noon, and night, was, I love you. We will be reunited and forever together again. Getting fired was probably the best thing that ever happened to me. Because, see, I... I I ended up move, coming back down here to Florida and reuniting with my family. I actually took the time to take care of myself and to get my PTSD under control. I remember one of the first counselors I went in to see, he asked me what my purpose was. And I didn't know how to answer that. Because see, without the military, it was like, my life was over. It took me a year to figure out my purpose. But my purpose is I want to go to work for the VA and I want to work with soldiers who are coming back out of the military and transitioning into life and I want to specialize in PTSD. So now I'm studying to be a social worker at UCF.
after I got out, I made one bad decision after another. I got into a bad mortgage. I sold our home because it was directly underneath a flight path of helicopters. I moved back to Orlando and I took one useless college course and then another. Eventually I figured out the kind of help that my family and my boys and I needed. I got my master's degree and I went back to the VA as a work study. I got scooped right in. The office they put me in to work was the third most hated place to be in the whole VA. And by the time I was promoted out of it, it wasn't even on the director's radar. I fell in love at the VA with PG, the candy machine mechanic. And he's been romancing me with honey buns every day, every day since. My kids see me going to college, graduating, working, doing normal things that normal people do. There's stability there, hope. Because of my only child, Antoine, went to the Marines. I have many military veterans, sons and daughters that came back that can receive my love that I was given Antoine. Many of you, all of you, each and every one of you, served your country. Each and every one of you gave all, physically, mentally, emotionally. My heart is for you all. Thank you for the service to your country. And we are military family for life. I love you all. Negative experiences. They're just as important as positive ones. They teach us lessons, they put us on certain paths. Since I've gotten out of the military, I've dealt with some severe mental health issues. But it's also the path that led me to my wife. I've been hospitalized four times in the last few years alone. But she's been with me every step of the way. So you see, those negative experiences, they were necessary for the positive ones. Now, I'm very passionate about speaking up about mental health awareness, be it with my veteran performance poetry group, the Combat Hippies, or as an individual artist. But every time I get off that stage, I'm mentally and emotionally drained. It hurts. It takes me to some very dark places. But I welcome it because it helps me tremendously in terms of my own mental health to use my words and my voice to help heal myself and the community in which we are all a part of. I think I'm on a good path now and there's some light at the end of the tunnel for me, but I'm just one. And so many of us are still floundering and killing ourselves each day. I'm reminded of Lewis Puller Jr., son of the famed Marine General Chesty Puller. Lewis went to Vietnam and stepped on a mine that shredded both of his legs. He came back and he fell into alcoholism. And then he sobered up and he wrote a book called Fortunate Son. It had a happy ending. He made it. He'd sobered up. He got a law degree. He was working in Washington, D.C. on veterans' causes. The book even won a Pulitzer Prize for nonfiction. And then a few years later, he relapsed and killed himself. So I don't trust happy endings anymore. How do we stop this veteran suicide epidemic from happening? How do we stop the cycle of shoving down our pain and medicating away our feelings? They don't go away, they're still here. I study in a master's degree for mental health counseling now, and I don't know any way to stop this from happening that doesn't involve massive changes to our culture and way of life. This country needs to learn to just listen to its veterans, not for what you want to hear about nationalism or her heroism or healing, but for whatever needs to come. Rage, maybe, grief, remorse, wailing, weeping, crying, screaming, pounding our fists on the earth. And nobody knows how to hear that, but that's what we carry. <sighs> I dream of opening healing centers. The community, veterans and civilians can 
come together to share, reintegrate, and heal after war. I want the person listening to, and the person speaking to act as a kind of team, with those listening doing so with the purpose of helping to carry this weight. People like us stand in the middle, releasing the pain and the horrors with our words. The civilians that stand around us, listening, accepting, and holding us safe. As we reach into our own darkness, pull out a small part of us, blow off the dust and hand it to you, hoping that you will take it seriously and treat it tenderly. These these, These are, are our words, words but they, they are, are so much more than that. that. Jim England, United States Army, retired. Staff Sergeant Michelle Sutter, United States Air Force, Gold Star Widow, Staff Sergeant Luis Melinda Sanchez. Deborah Smith, Gold Star Mother, Mass Corporal Smith, Antoine Demetrius, United States Marine Corps. Harlan Walner, United States Army. Alan Miner, United States Army. This program was made possible by the Florida Humanities Council. We come from all over and we become one state where we share in the history and become part of the culture that is Florida. The Florida Humanities Council, bringing Floridians together by sharing the stories of our state.